Okay, so now we're recording, so why don't we uh, kick this off? I just have a little disclosure to read, um, and then we can dive in here. So pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting laws, general laws, chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Plimpton School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public has been permitted, but every effort has been made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order using Zoom, either by computer or telephone. Uh, this meeting is being recorded for informational purposes only and is not considered to be a public record. So with that piece of it out of the way, I'm going to jump into my own little bit here. Um, Given that we have a number of participants, usually at this point, probably about 40 more people than we usually see at a meeting, uh, and I expect that to go up a little more. Um, we're going to run the meeting a little more formatted than we typically do. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm uh, going to make some initial comments, uh, and then I'm going to ask the administration uh, to make a presentation to us. Uh, school committee is then going to have some discussion about what's presented. Uh, we're then going to look for any comments that the uh, teachers who have joined us may have, and then we are going to let the parents offer some comments. Um, I would like to, uh, and, and questions, and I would like to address every comment and question here tonight, but if we run short on time, um, we can determine that as we go further along here, then I will certainly make sure that we make ourselves available, or at least I will do another parent chat that we did, uh, is that the beginning of this week? all a blur, um, but I will do another one early next week um, to make sure that we can continue to ask questions. Um, I would also emphasize that things are literally changing daily, and so that anything that we talk about here tonight, it is to our best of our knowledge what our plans are. Uh, plans are subject to change, which I know is not helpful. Trust us, it's not helpful for us either. Um, but we will certainly keep you guys and everyone on here informed as we can through regular modes of communication. Uh, so uh, what I wanted to just make out, make sure that we all understood here is sort of what this, what the, quickly at a high level what the process is and what we are doing here tonight. Um, we are required by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and Jill, I'm sorry, I'm stealing probably some of your slides, but I'm just gonna do it anyways, because if you hear it twice, it's good. Uh, required us to do two levels of planning. Um, one was to do a preliminary plan and for the school committees to review and offer their thoughts on that, which we did uh, last week at our school committee meeting. And tonight we are looking at a more comprehensive plan and we are required to, uh, to vote on this plan and submit this to the state by next week. Um, this is a comprehensive plan. It's certainly a lot longer than the four pages that we sent to Desi uh, on Friday. But this is not the implementation plan. Uh, when we're done voting here, Mr. Benito and his staff has a lot more work to do to try and make that turn into reality as to what we do. So we are not going to have answers for everything here tonight. Uh, one other thing that I would like to just mention is that uh, we have to be careful of the information that's running around out there. Um, there was some information that indicated that last week we were voted for, we voted the preliminary plan, and again, that wasn't a plan. Uh, we voted it to be remote only, full remote. That is not what we voted. We voted a hybrid approach with the potential for some remote at the beginning of the school year in an effort to make sure that we can get things done right so that we can keep schools open. Um, Tonight is a separate vote. We're going to look through the information the administration is going to present to us. We're going to listen to some comments, and then we are going to provide a vote on the plan tonight before the meeting is concluded. Okay, so with that, um, Jill, would you like to um, dive into the presentation? Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask the school committee members that unless you have a burning question, Let's kind of wait till the end so that we can get through that presentation and then have a good discussion. Yes, I'm going to share with uh, everyone the presentation. And if you could let me know if you see it. Yes, it's up. 
Okay. So uh, we were asked by the Department of Education to create a re-entry plan that provided an in-person learning model, a hybrid learning model, and a remote learning model. And ideally, these three plans would fit together to allow us to shift from one or the other based upon the realities of the virus and the situations we found ourselves in. Before we talk about the comprehensive plan that we have given to the school committee for consideration, we wanted to share with you some of the data. Uh, after our last meeting together, uh, some school committee members had reached out and some school committees had asked for uh, a, a commitment uh, in a survey type form to be sent out to families. Um, they felt it would help them to inform uh, their decisions. In doing so, um, we recognized that some parents would not be able to make a decision without a more comprehensive plan. And that is understandable. Nonetheless, we do have some data to share with you based upon that survey that was conducted on August 2nd. So this is the entire district. This includes all of our schools. And what you can see is out of 3,572 respondents, 2,010 participated. That's about a 56% response rate. If you look at all of the schools combined, 48.9 prefer a full in-person learning with three feet social distancing. 36.4% prefer hybrid learning at six feet distancing. And 14.5, uh, sorry, 6% prefer remote. So you can see that um, there is a variety of preferences in our schools and across the district. The two issues um, that uh, came to the forefront that we have really been wrestling with in terms of in-person um, is district provided transportation. It's not the only obstacle that we face in certain schools um, or in all schools, uh, but it's one, it's a major factor in terms of determining the feasibility of certain models at this time. At this time in a previous presentation, I explained the one that our, our buses would fit approximately one third the amount of students that they currently fit. As a regional school district, we are required to provide transportation. We share our buses. Even if we did not share our buses, elementary schools would be, would be required to provide transportations for students who live two or more miles from school. So one of the things that uh, we were wondering is how many people would be willing to commit to driving their child to school? 51.8% said that they would be willing to commit to driving their child to school. 11.2% said, no, I plan to uh, my child to learn remotely. And 37% said yes, that their student would take the bus. The reality is, is that we must provide transportation for students who need transportation. But this gives us some insight into what our ridership may be. The other thing we wanted to try to plan for is how many of our families would commit to remote learning at that time. And 15.2% said that they would be willing to com commit to fully remote learning. Here are the responses for Plimpton. Here you can see out of, 20, uh, out of 217 respondents, 127 were able to respond. That's a 58.5% response rate. 56.3% of parents preferred a full in-person learning experience at three feet. 35.2% preferred hybrid learning at six feet, and 8.6% preferred remote learning. Now remember, these are percentages based on the respondents. So again, I, I wanna reiterate that this is a 58.5% response rate. 
In terms of the district provided transportation, 64.8 of our parents in Plimpton said, no, I will provide transportation for my child. 26.6% said that their child would need to take the bus. And 8.6% said that their child, they planned for their child to learn remotely. So therefore they wouldn't need to take the bus. When we asked the commitment uh, question regarding remote learning, 13.3% said that they were willing to commit to fully to remote learning. So uh, one of the things that has arisen that may um, come to be as part of our discussion tonight, but I wanted to put that out there in terms of uh, commitments and the role that they could play in terms of the comprehensive plan that we submit. Um, one, we could issue new commitment forms based upon the plan that is voted. Uh, families will need more information about their school's plan would then have that additional information that we have at this time. Again, as our chair has stated, the information is constantly changing or being added to and we continually get updates from the state. So again, it's the best we can do at this time and we apologize for that. We would provide families with three days to make a decision and that's not very long and I understand that too. The problem is, is that our principals and their staff and our administrative team need as much time as possible. Every day that we delay in making a decision, it means that we're that much farther away from delivering the best possible educational program that we can, regardless of how we determine we will enter school in the fall. We need those days. Typically these decisions are made in the spring. The finer details are worked out during the summer. We have a very tight timeline and we are asking for an inordinate amount of work to be done in a very short period of time. That's why we would need these, this information sooner rather than later. And again, we recognize that this is not ideal. We would then send these decisions to the building principals and the bus company to inform the student schedules and to inform bus route planning. That's the proposed next steps with regards to how we could make this data uh, more viable and applicable to the plans at hand. Our chair has already explained the, uh, the two-step process of what we must do. We must indicate our intent of how we plan to reopen. Regardless of our intent and the plan, the plan will still need to be approved by the state and it will still be subject to bargain. In my previous presentation, we talked about some of the strengths and weaknesses of each of the models. And I do not pretend that each of the models don't have different strengths and weaknesses. And none of the models present what we have come to know and love about school in the past. But in light of the realities that we are facing, school will look different regardless of how we return. So in-person learning at three feet distancing would allow the highest number of our students to be able to return to in-person face-to-face instruction. And we recognize the fact that there is no replacement for quality in-person instruction. The problems with the three feet distancing in-person is that the three feet distancing meets all of the DESE guidelines, but it is less than the current CDC guidelines. It would increase our bus route needs significantly and it would be costly. Not all of our staff can return to school to serve students in person. And arrivals and lunches present a spacing issue because even if students in the classroom are only at three feet distancing, there are certain parts of the day where a lunch in particular where we must maintain, even under DESE guidance, we must maintain six feet distancing for lunches because students would not have masks on. The hybrid model, which I recommended during the last meeting, would allow for six feet spacing needs 
which would meet the CDC recommended guidelines. Students would attend school in person and remotely so that learning is continuous. We would be able to transport students using the current routes with some, potentially some additional cost to some communities. The problems with the hybrid model is that it is disruptive for families and childcare because students would be attending school in person two out of five school days. And they would be attending remote learning for three out of five school days. Scheduling of cohorts of students for learning at a potential burden to families. So one of the things we have tried to advocate for is a common approach to the reopening of schools. We have some families who have children in more than one school. And so we would do our very best to try to make sure that family cohorts were attending school on the same day to help with the burden of students attending schools on different days in a family. A typical school operational day is the best standard for teaching and learning. And we do not pretend that the hybrid model could possibly replace that. Nonetheless, these are the strengths and weaknesses of the model. The remote learning model is the safest possible model from a medical perspective with regards to COVID. It provides parents and students with structured schedules. The problems with strictly remote learning is that it's not as effective as in-person learning. We also have some students uh, who are suffering from the isolation. We know that school is a place that helps our students socially, emotionally, and can even protect them um, in terms of mental trauma. Re remote learning is also another potential burden for families with regards to childcare. So in the last meeting, I recommended a hybrid model for those reasons. The maintenance of six feet distancing, the fact that we required three feet distancing on the bus, the fact that we cannot deny bus transportation, that the hybrid model would focus on core requirements in person. It would allow us to maintain social emotional connections. It would allow us to provide live daily instruction in person or remote, and it would maintain a variety of disciplines and interests for our students. Those were the reasons for my proposals last week. In the plan, you will see that there is a letter from me that has to be included in every school's plan. This letter is merely a draft. It would need to be changed to reflect the, um, the decision of the school committee this evening. It contains our guiding principles, which placed the focus on providing uh, not only the safety of students and staff, but promoting our educational goals as well. We have talked about the need to potentially send commitment forms in order for us to help build our model in our implementation plans. And so we would be looking for the committee to um, consider uh, including as part of that the extension of that deadline to submit commitments um, a few days after uh, the, the plan is due so that our, our principal and his staff could begin planning the implementation plan. Included in the plan are the health and safety requirements for in-person learning. I've also linked them here as a reference. Again, these are the minimum standards uh, that we would we would need to meet and certainly um, any additional changes would need to be reflected prior to submitting the plan but could also be bolstered through, through our efforts when we um, when we work with our principal in the implementation phase as well the plan also includes summaries of each model in-person hybrid and remote because again regardless of how we anticipate to open there could be things beyond our control that force us to open in a particular way. Now I'm going to turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Lynch to discuss some of the details of the plan with you. 
Thank you, Jill. Um, parts of our reopening plan for Plimpton uh, include the requirements uh, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So our our draft reopening plan is is 32 pages for Plimpton. So we wanted to provide um, a general overview on what some of those changes would be um, requirements for for in person learning. So for in person learning with um, the hybrid or, or full in-person um, masks are required in school for grade two and above. Um, at our last uh, Plimpton meeting, um, we discussed uh, highlighting that um, masks are strongly encouraged for uh, pre-K, K, and one as well to reflect um, the health and safety of, of all students and staff, so that's included. Um, adults, including educators and staff, are required to, to wear masks and face coverings, and exceptions are allowed um, due to some different conditions that are listed here, including, um, you know, behavioral disability impacts and things like that. Um, at Dennett, they've secured um, additional masks to be able to supply to staff and students, um, but it is requested that uh, families um, would provide masks to students so that um, students are, are prepared, um, but schools do have uh, and have secured um, additional masks. Masks are required for all students on the bus. Everybody on the bus needs to have a mask. Um, the next slide talks a little bit more about that. And there's some guidance about transparent masks, which could help younger students and deaf and hard of hearing uh, for their teachers. Um, one thing that's discussed in the guidance that's helpful too is mask breaks and what's referred to as uh, mask culture. There's some recommendations um, from the Parabola project that um, include ideas for teaching younger children about the importance of masks and um, how to provide breaks and how to do that safely. So uh, that's a good resource that's included in the uh, reopening plan um, for Dennett as well. Here's a little bit more about buses that um, safe social distancing and mask wearing starts at the bus stop. So everyone on the bus and, and obviously other places, but in terms of the, the requirements, everyone on the bus and, and waiting for the bus has to wear a mask and cover the nose and mouth at all times. And Jill referred to the one third rule uh, on school buses. So that means one student per bench uh, si siblings or people who uh, live in the same household um, may sit together, but uh, other than that, one student per bench. And as um, COVID-19 is a respiratory um, virus, uh, windows and roof hatches should be kept open on buses to improve ventilation. There's even guidance that in colder weather um, that the windows would remain somewhat open to uh, increase the amount of fresh air in buses. Jill included some information about three feet of social distancing and also six feet. So this, this just clarifies that um, DESE's guidance recommends uh, six feet wherever possible, but says that um, you could go, the minimum distance is three feet. And the way that that's measured, there's a lot of facilities guidance, but it's basically seat edge to seat edge. So when we talk about three feet of, of distance, that, that's how it's measured. Um, in our in per if the full in time per I'm sorry the full time in person model um, outlined by the uh, Department of Elementary Secondary Education says that it's six feet where possible but permits um, permits three feet and there's a lot of guidance about how to set up classrooms in different arrangements but it's recommended that um, teachers assign seats try to group students uh, as much as possible um, and keep materials associated with the same students um, throughout the day to minimize potential transmission. To, to continue with that, there's a little bit more information on uh, remaining with uh, students remaining with their homeroom at the elementary level, traveling to specials as a cohort or to have the specials teacher uh, come to the home-based classroom. There would need to be new travel patterns and hallways that would be developed as part of the implementation plan at Dennett, including staggered passing times, um, signs and floor markings uh, could assist in those changes. 
uh, our nurses across the district um, did, did a great job with suggestions about how to make sure that um, students who regularly access the nurse are able to do that in a safe way and also provide a way for other students to come down um, that with uh, different needs. So that's also there uh, included in, in this plan. And we appreciate how, um, you know, Nurse Fox and the other nurses work together to provide that for, for our district. Um, at lunch, students um, have to be, obviously students don't eat with masks on, so six feet of social distancing is the minimum. Um, and students are, it's recommended that they remain with their cohort uh, during, during lunchtime. There's lots of facilities guidance, but basically um, cleaning and dis disinfecting will occur um, at least every day for shared spaces. Higher touch surfaces would be cleaned uh, and dis disinfected multiple times a day. Our new facilities director, Matt Durkee, uh, has secured hospital grade electrostatic sprayers to uh, help with disinfecting, including a cleaning agent that's um, proven to be effective against the coronavirus. Uh, along with that, um, became protective equipment for our custodial and facility staff to ensure that they're um, safe while, while using um, the sprayers and other cleaning materials. The guidance recommends that as much fresh air as possible is brought um, into the building, including um, reducing the, the use of circ recirculated air and improving the amount of uh, fresh air that comes in. And in line with that, um, it, it's, it is recommended that indoor spaces without windows and adequate HVAC not be used for classroom purposes. So our facilities director has um, looked at uh, Dennett and all of our other schools across the district and identified those rooms that are not suitable to be used as classrooms so that um, alternate arrangements can be made to keep students and staff safe. Sorry about that. Some of the next steps that we would propose taking would be the student and staff commitments and the assignments. That's critical to building the schedules and the plans. I've mentioned before that once the school committee votes a plan with its intention of how it plans to reopen, it is still subject to approval by the state and subject to bargaining. The principals would begin immediately creating building level operational plans. Some of the pieces to these operational plans would include arrival and dismissal procedures. We've discussed in the past the potential need to stagger arrival times, especially if more students are being dropped off. Classroom configuration and physical distancing would need to be literally um, marked out in some respects and set up. Meals for students would need to be planned. Uh, right now, for the most part, we're looking at most likely a grab and go type option uh, to minimize contacts. And we're looking at facility configuration and potential changes based upon whatever safety measures we need to put in place and whatever additional safety measures may be presented to us, uh, either from the school committee or from the state. We are uh, working on um, using a number of our days at the start of the school year to train uh, in safety measures, including cleaning and disinfecting. One of the things um, that uh, would need to be considered is that the commissioner uh, has agreed to change the school year to, for this year only, to change the school year to 170 days instead of, of 180 days. That would allow us to add of up to 10 days prior to the start of school for the express purpose of training and safety needs and preparing for the school year in a, uh, with a safety and preparation type focus. Only days that are used in this way would be um, allowable. And I'm often asked the question, can we use some of those days later in the school year? No, all of the days must be used prior to September 16th. However, we decide to open, we can open no later than September 16th. And by open, I mean in-person, hybrid, or remote. So 
as part of your packets this evening, you'll see a calendar with a proposed start date change from September 2nd to September 16th that would allow us to utilize a number of days specifically for training purposes with our staff. I'm gonna turn it over to Principal Venito to discuss some sample schedules. Thanks, Jill. Um, so just as a baseline, what I tried to do with three different uh, models is at the beginning of a typical school year, we do a master schedule where I assign which grade level is having lunch and recess at what time and what time uh, specialists would be happening. And seeing how we didn't have much of a baseline, I figured that would be the logical place to start. So the three models that you're going to look at would be the real models for grade three. It was just a middle of the road um, sample. So in this hybrid model, this is one that I adapted to um, the two days on, two days off, meaning on Monday and Tuesday, given our current numbers, there's 32 students, we would have the same 16 students in the building on Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday would be professional development and collaboration and then remote learning for all students. Then a separate 16 students would be in for Thursday, Friday. We're considering them the cohort B and cohort D students. And as I said, I typically give teachers their time for lunch and recess in specialists, which is why I did not make it super specific. Uh, I don't intend on tailing grade three, you need to teach math at this time, you need to teach ELA at that time. Instead, I, I tend to give them blocks of time so that they can do what's best for their specific grade level. So from 8.30 to 10.50, I left that wide open for you decide, let me know, ELA, math, science, social studies, social emotional learning. Um, so that's gonna be happening live for kids on Monday, Tuesday. They'll have Wednesday, they'll be at home. The group A will be at home Thursday, Friday. Group D will be with group B on Thursday, Friday live. And in the last column over, I tried to do a quick mathematical total on um, the minutes per week on learning and that's totaled at the bottom. In the next slide is some of the details about this particular model. Um, it directly reflects the model that staff and students are familiar with, so that is beneficial. Uh, schedules for in-person cohorts A and D, Monday, Tuesday, and B and D, Thursday, Friday, will be the same for the remote cohorts, B and D on Monday, Tuesday, and A and D on Thursday, Friday. I know that's a lot to process, and I'm, I'm not trying to go quickly, but um, that's essentially what I just outlined. Um, what's interesting for us, because of our specific numbers per grade at some grade levels there will be one classroom teacher that will be assigned assigned to in-person learning and one classroom teacher that will be strictly assigned to remote learning that works strictly because we have 15 or fewer students in three different grade levels so for three different grade levels i've asked the team to tell me who wants to be responsible for in-person learning and who wants to be responsible for strictly remote learning and that's an internal conversation that we're working on right now um, in grades where that is not convenient, where we have 15, uh, 16 or more students per class, this is where we had to get a little bit more creative, and this is kind of where our numbers work against us in some regards. Um, at that point, all interventionists, meaning Title I, special education, reading, math, will assist in in-person teaching as well as remote learning. I have some grade levels that are 20 and 21 per classroom, which would necessitate the teachers working in person with their groups uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. They don't, they don't have the luxury of having free days, quote unquote. So at that point, we would be pulling from anybody that is a certified teacher. You might be teaching a little bit outside of what is the norm, what you've normally done, but we do have enough people to make sure that, for instance, if we were to focus on ELA and math, the days that you're with your in-person teacher, we have certified people that would be able to teach SEL, science, social studies on days that you're not seeing your teacher in school. Uh, another challenge that we were looking at, um, could you back up for one second, Joe? Thank you. Whoop. Thank you. Um, the challenge, another challenge that we face is that all of our specialist teachers are considered to be 0.4 people, meaning that they're there two, two days a week as opposed to five, which is the you know, traditional model. 
So we had to get a little creative here. All specialists would, would be remote to students in school, in working remotely at home. Based on their work hours, our specialists will have to have, at some point, some pre-recorded lessons and activities planned for some remote learning. I, I would require them to have office hours available as well. Um, the, tr the trouble being, or, or other buildings that have people there full-time have the luxury of their, their schedules can be much more flexible. The fact that our specialists are only two days a week, it, it, it is very, um, very constricting when trying to schedule a hybrid model. But I, th I think we've, we've got some decent plans in place to make that work. So the in-person model, it would be wonderful. I'm not sure how completely realistic this model is at this point in time. Um, this would be basically traditional school. And if we were all able to get back into school, and granted with this particular group, again, 32 students, um, not knowing what our cohort C is, I would simply break them up 16 and 16. And that would be school as we've known it in the past. And based on a lot of the information that has been shared at school committee, this is not a model that we're particularly, um, particularly interested in. It just, it doesn't make sense for our size and for our school. However, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jill, I can point out some highlights. Um, again, this directly reflects the model that staff and students are familiar with. Uh, almost identical to the hybrid and remote models for consistency in planning purposes. We want this to be as consistent as possible, only because if we do establish some kind of a hybrid model at some point, we understand that there's a, a very distinct possibility that we're going to have to go to remote, and we want them to be as similar as possible. Um, in this model, students will be divided into groups that follow the six-foot social distancing guidelines for classrooms. Therefore, each classroom will be slightly different due to square footage, staffing, and enrollment. And again, using the six-foot guidelines, most classrooms can accommodate between 15 to 18 students. Um, this, however, would necessitate the need for additional classrooms to be utilized for overflow. Smaller offices such as OTPT, reading, the gym, the cafeteria, specialist Title I, we're, we're trying to leave no stone unturned. Uh, and if Wednesday is in school, you'd revert back to that master schedule model. But again, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, I don't think that that's kind of the direction we're heading in. Uh, the last one is the remote. Uh, just, excuse me one second. Yeah, this would be the full remote schedule. And again, trying to keep minutes on the far right-hand column as accurate as we can and as, as close to actual in school as we can. And again, for us, not to repeat myself, but this presents challenges in itself. Um, like I said, your, your homeroom teacher that you were assigned at the end of the year, that, that model might have to disappear a little bit just based on numbers. So again, you might have uh, one teacher for ELA and math. You might have another person teaching social studies, teaching science. Um, like I said, we're, we're trying to not leave any doors closed and we're trying to be as creative as possible to make this effective. We're not totally satisfied with the product that came out in the spring, but that was learning on the fly. And, and I think everybody did the best job that we could. If it turns out to be a full remote situation with that, that's highly likely. We wanna beef up and provide a, a, a more robust program that would most similarly reflect a typical school day. Um, again, I already highlighted that first note. Um, students would be divided into groups, much like the full person in population. Homerooms will meet each day and follow the schedule. Grade level teachers will collaborate to design a more detailed daily schedule for students to follow. I think that was one of the downfalls that we saw with what happened in the spring is uh, there was a lack of consistency, and that's something that we need to improve upon. Um, at each grade level, there'll be two classroom teachers assigned to remote learning, much like it would if they were in the building. Remote cohorts would be directed by a combination of two classroom teachers, special ed teacher, and a paraprofessional. In addition, Title I reading and our two reading teachers would be able to assist in direct instruction. All specialists definitely would be remote each day, and if all remote cohorts would be rethought to lessen class sizes online. I think that's about as comprehensive as we can get at this point. So I, I hope that is a satisfactory report for everybody.
So at this time, we'd uh, ask the chair if the chair has any questions for us. John, you have yourself muted right now. Thank you. That's because I didn't want to talk. No. Um, so normally I end up doing a lot of talking. I'm going to turn it to other school committee members. I'd like them to offer any thoughts they have. And then as a reminder, we will then, when we have sort of offered thoughts and talked through that, we'll offer it up to the teachers if they would like to offer anything, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Um, so who wants to have at it first? Well, I'll step up to the plate. First of all, um, I'd like to thank everybody for their efforts that they put into this. This has been a long march, as Jill said last night. I love that term, but it's sadly true. Um, Peter, uh, I commend you on finding a way to make the three different modalities that we could be looking at blend very well with each other. What we're doing tonight is we're not voting one plan over another. We're voting one plan that has these three modes built into them. We're just indicating where we plan on beginning our school year. So great job in finding that um, consistency between all three models for our students and our families. Um, Ryan and Jill, um, putting together four of these plans and just a couple of nights takes a lot of work. And I appreciate um, the thoroughness with um, how you laid out to the state uh, our intents and, and what our thoughts are. I just want to be uh, particularly cautious since we as a committee last week indicated that we would not accept anything less than six feet, that that be noted somewhere within what we're sending to DESE. And also, um, we would require all students K to six who are medically able to be wearing masks as well during the school day. Um, so those are just some of the, the real basics behind um, you know, where we are right now, but I think the plan is beautiful as laid out for us today so far. Thank you. We will, um, one of the issues that we face is that we must present um, a plan. And so what we're going to do is after all of the votes, there will be, um, we will do our best to also note differences among the towns as they as they're you know amended or created and i guess i'd just add to that jason I, I think i would clarify what you said a little bit to say we are building a plan the plan includes the modes and we are also going to provide our intention of how we would like the plan to be implemented um and the piece that i i would like to make sure that the folks understand and this is i think certainly how i view it and i believe the community views it this way too is that these these aren't sitting in their own little boxes or like circles like and like a, and you're not jumping from one circle to the other you could be moving between them and so they sit on a spectrum and like even if we get to level four and we get to a point in the state and we get to a point where it is safe to come back with full school we aren't going to flip a switch probably and and, <clears throat> and and push everybody in the next day it's going to be a process to move into that it's a process to move out of it uh, it's a process, I think that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is this process to get the school open and move into the hybrid plan. But there could be some challenges there. We've never done this before, okay? We haven't done it before. And if we don't do it right, we're going to be remote because something's going to go wrong and we're going to have to do that. So what we're trying to do is make sure that we can open up, we can get our kids into the school, get them some of what they need, albeit very different, and try and keep that open as long as we can. So that's, that's part of that. Um, other members, do you have thoughts, comments, questions? Um, I'd just like to mirror what Jason said and thank you. Put so much into these plans all together and into one thing, but uh, Peter having to actually put them into action in the building, that's uh, a tremendous undertaking. Um, I just want to reiterate about the three feet as opposed to the six. Um, speaking for myself, the the three feet is just an absolute non-starter for me um, because kids inherently are going to take that three feet down to nothing. Um, and, you know, Desi deciding that um, with 
evidence on both sides of the argument that three feet is good. Uh, the entire world has, has uh, embraced six feet since January when everybody imploded. And um, as much as the economy and getting kids back to school and parents back to work, as important as all of that is, um, speaking on my own behalf, you know, my, my uh, most precious commodity, my son or my sons, um, I'm just not willing to compromise on that six feet that's been accepted worldwide um, just to get our kids back into school. Um, because I'm, not to be too gruff about it, but let's face it, if, if one of our children get this disease, uh, this virus, and it's going to wind up shutting down the school and the education and the social interaction is irrelevant when your child's in the hospital with COVID-19. And, and that's really where I'm hanging my hat. Um, and I just, I, I won't budge on anything under six feet. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Amy, did you have any comments? Yeah, I had a couple of questions. Yep. Um, Peter, when you were going through the, the hybrid model, um, what about the smaller classes, the ones that have under 15 kids? Would that change at all? Potentially, yes. Um, I think anything is, I think everything is fluid right now. Um, there was potential, you know, we had the conversation about, well, if they're under 15, can we get everybody in all four days? In theory, yes. On paper, yes. I think that's going to be, that's going to rely, or, or some, some factors are going to be, what is it going to do to our cafeteria numbers each day? What is it going to do to our busing each day? So I, I can't give a solid answer on that right now, but those are definitely things that I've considered. And I know that those particular grade levels have had conversations. Um, I know grade six is waiting to hear back from me and I haven't forgotten about you grade six. I just haven't gotten to you yet. Um, but no, there is potential there. The challenge there is then do I, do I start running two separate, two completely separate programs where I have these particular grade levels doing one thing, these particular grade levels doing another, and, and overall, I think it just becomes, it becomes a numbers game. What makes the most sense? What's the, what's the most safe? Also, I know we had discussed this before about lunches. Are we set on them being in the cafeteria or was there the option of eating them in the classroom to, you know, expose the kids to less? The models that we're looking at right now have the kids in the cafeteria in limited numbers. Um, there were some some science about not having them in, in the classrooms. Uh, the, the plan right now moving forward is the kids would basically have assigned seats. They would come in, sit in their assigned seat. If, and again, once I get a, a, a hard number, how many can we fit in there? If there's going to be spillover, do I have to have somebody in the gym as well? And again, trying to create that schedule is challenging where I don't know what we have for numbers per day right now. So can I just add one thing there? You know, Everything that we're talking about right at this point is as of right at this point, and it's without the numbers that Mr. Venito needs. Right. This is not the implementation plan. And the other thing I want to make sure folks understand is that if, we're try if we try to do this to provide a little more social interaction for our students, which I think is the reason why we're trying to do this, if we get into the school year and we have to shut down, and then we open back up and we have to shut down again, we may decide to change route. You know, I mean, it, it, it all depends on what's happening, what goes on. It also depends on what information we're getting back. You know, if you're finding out that schools that make everyone eat in the classroom are having less issues with shutting down than ones that are doing it in the cafeteria, then we're going to change course. And so this is going, this is going to be, go figure, it's going to be a year of change and it's going to be your constant change. And then we'll try and provide as much stability within that world of change that we can. But I think as, a, as an administration, as a, as a, as a school committee, we're, we're, we're committed to making this work. But with, in doing that, we gotta move quickly and we gotta adapt. Did you have any other questions? Go ahead, Dan. I just have one more question for Peter. Uh, are there any classes or grades specific that the six foot model will not work with the space size that we have. Like you use yes. 16 and 16 work perfect because you have 15 to 18 in a class. Do we, do we run into a problem somewhere along the, the, 
the range here? Yes. Um, I have all, all but one of the classrooms set up with desks at six feet right now. Uh, just as an example, we had one set up at three feet. And for three grade levels, theoretically and on paper, we could potentially get whole classes in there. For the other four grade levels, we could not. But I think what Dan was asking, are there any grade levels where we have an issue that we can't fit them in the classroom in the hybrid model? In other words, splitting the class in half and doing half and half. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no that should not be an issue. Okay, good. Thank you for clarifying, John. So I'd also like to just state that those 10 days for professional development and allowing teachers to model their classrooms and understand safety protocols better, um, I don't see any reason why we wouldn't utilize all 10 of those days that have been granted to us by DESE this year. Um, so um, that's another item that I would uh, fight strongly for to keep in our plan. Jason, if I may. Yep. I think in, um, I've given this a lot of thought and, and I think that this, the plan is going to work no matter what we vote. We will make it work. We will make it work for our kids. I think the most important time is going to be that 10 day period when I can get in with my staff who knows the kids intimately, we can get in and we can plan appropriately what makes sense, what's going to make sense for cohort C. How do we divide up cohort A and B? Uh, how do we get cohort D in so that they're receiving the maximum amount of services? That's going to, when we can do as much as we can remotely, but me being in that school with my staff who knows these kids inside and out, that's going to be the most important time to make this plan work, regardless of what it is. It's going to be collaboration. It's going to be professionals working with each other. It's going to be taking time to schedule appropriately what makes sense for our families, what makes sense for our kids. That's what's going to pull this whole thing together, in my opinion. I thank you for giving that color to what it looks like on the inside of the classroom. I, I know there is some trepidation with the wording that we used on how we would like to approach the school year. Um, when we were approaching the initial guidance from DESE, um, it pretty much had a hard remote hybrid all in person decision making tree. And I understand that we confused some people with the way we said we'd like to start remote and phase into hybrid. And what we would like to do, and Desi has clarified the definition of what hybrid is, is what we would like to see is a phased and hybrid approach in Plimpton. And we can do a phased and hybrid approach as long as our campus is open for any of our students, uh, mixed with remote teaching for any of our other students. So again, as John was saying, our, our job here tonight is not to open schools. Our job is to open schools in a way that they will have the greatest possible chance of staying open. Um, you know, the open, close, open, close just creates so many transitions for our students. And, um, you know, Plimpton has done a great job with its COVID-19 numbers. Um, we've had zero cases in the past 14 days, but that number, you know, is something we're going to have to keep our eye on very closely. And it's really incumbent upon the community that they continue to do all the things right that we've been doing to keep that number so low. If those numbers creep up, we won't have a decision to make here tonight. Schools will be closed for us. So again, um, I am proposing that we begin the school year with a phased in hybrid approach and we allow Peter and his team to determine exactly what that looks like and who he brings in at what pace and at what point. And I'm not talking about months, my friends who are listening. I'm talking about some weeks to get this right and to do a slow roll so we don't make a misstep that causes us to have to shut down the entire system. And I think it's also important to know that as we build the implementation plans, we can identify what that looks like. But to be able to put a specific, or really to put an arbitrary date on that tonight, I don't think would be of use to anybody here because it would likely change. So, you know, one of the things that we're gonna ask folks to be understanding about is that we know you need some certainty or at least as much certainty as we can give you in this world of change and we will get that to you, but we wanna do it thoughtfully and in a way that actually is something that can be done and make sure it works right for your kids uh, uh, and, and our school and our teachers. 
do we have any other comments? Are we ready to solicit some from the teachers first? Good. Um, any teachers, any teachers who want to, to speak up, just throw something in the chat, please. And I'll call, I'll call on you to come on. Well, you can always speak in the next part of it. Um, I will, uh, looks like, is it Amy Varnum? Looks like you had a comment from Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question is related to, God forbid, we do have a case that either is a staff or a student that does test positive or does um, exhibit symptoms of COVID. What are the steps and procedures that will take place to ensure contact tracing, disinfectant, et cetera? Uh, we, we have not talked about that yet as a committee, other than at a very high level. We do have, uh, do plan to speak uh, at least some to that tonight. There's also in the comprehensive plan, there are a fair amount of requirements listed there uh, following DESE's guidance. Um, I think we are going to have probably a little bit more. And of course, the other thing to think about is that each town is quite different in the district in size, and we have to be uh, you know, cautious about that as well. Um, so there is going to be a lot more to come on that. We'll talk a little bit about it tonight too, um, but we probably aren't ready to tell you exactly what we are or aren't doing um, other than at a, at a high level because we have to get to, again, to that point of implementation. So we're thinking about it a lot actually right now because we've gotten through the other piece of it and now we're focusing more towards implementation. Um, but there will be very, there will be clear standard protocols if it happens in school versus if it happens out of school. And then, uh, as Jason said, we will also be looking at what's going on in the community. We will be working with the town on that as well, because it's not just about what's going on within our little, our little world. It does also has some to do if we have a, if we have a spike in town. Um, uh, and also, think about it this way, it's also our school community. So maybe it's not, maybe it's not a parent it could be a relative or whatever, and what type of contact have they had and how could we bring it in. The other thing, I'll just take this, since you brought that up, I'll, make, I'll take this time to say this. Um, you know, and we have to work it out, but likely there's going to be, uh, if we're going to do this promptly and quickly, we're probably also going to need to have some level of self-reporting because the wheels may take a little bit longer to get to us if at the state they say, oh, there's a COVID case, how quickly are they going to pass that? to the health department and then to us. So, you know, the quicker we identify things, the quicker we can take the actions to keep the schools open. And just, just to jump on that and echo what you're saying, John, um, you know, Desi gave us 19 pages of guidance on how to handle different scenarios with COVID, but we also have the ability to have local controls over how we handle it. And just like this plan and how we're trying to tailor it to our own community and our unique school um, will do the same with how we respond to COVID incidents within the school and within the town. Um, it's not going to be something we take lightly and we're going to make sure that everybody before they walk into the school in September feels comfortable knowing how we will react to all those different scenarios. Amy, is that, is that good? Um, yeah, I just concerned like one more question is like like how come the nurses aren't involved more in this conversation? Um, I'd like to hear more from them and their medical piece of it all. I know education, like I, it's been said, obviously everyone's going to school for a reason and that is for education, but school really doesn't matter if our health isn't um, a priority. So I would really like to see some nurses on these calls, sure. but that's just my, personal opinion. Well, Jill, would you like to comment? Because I believe they've been quite involved in all of the planning and, and so on. So prior to school closure, our nurses began on um, considering ways that they could provide training for staff. Uh, over the summer, uh, we met with our, our nurses again to discuss uh, possible needs and how to best deliver 
training for staff, but also developmentally appropriate training for our students and making sure that our nurses um, are, are part of that process. In addition, we had working groups and on both the elementary working group and on the secondary working group, we had nurse representatives as well uh, to help us think about uh, potential issues and concerns. And, and while not everything may have been incorporated into this particular plan, uh, certain uh, features of their um, recommendations will be worked into implementation plans. All right, uh, Scott Devonshire, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, given some of the um, complexity with the hybrid model and the remote learners, and, and Peter was talking about how some teachers would need to kind of do um, multiple duties. How does that impact families that decide to be totally remote? Um, my fear is that some kids that are totally remote become homeschooled. Um, so, you know, that that's uh, something I'm just curious how they're going to solve. Yep, go ahead, John. So I think Pete can answer more specifically for his school, but generally speaking, some of our plans for remote learning to help try to, pro to improve upon um, the service is that remote learning will be scheduled. Unlike in the spring, there will be scheduled times for different disciplines as Peter um, highlighted in his presentation tonight. In addition, there will be staff assigned to those scheduled times to help support students and to interact with students. There will be both synchronous and asynchronous learning. There will be attendance expectations and there will be grading expectations, uh, similar to we've had grading in the past. And then finally, uh, we have the support of our school committee uh, to consider a new learning management platform to help facilitate the delivery of our remote learning um, and that, uh, that platform is called Schoology, and we believe that that will help facilitate uh, some of the concerns that were raised by um, not only parents, but also by our teachers with, in terms of ease of use for younger students and being able to communicate with younger students who do not have email, uh, for example. So it, it allows direct communication uh, between the, the, the teacher and the student via the platform. It also is a content platform as well. So it has a number of features that we think will be more student friendly. Um, and you can, I, I, forgive me if I use the incorrect term, but basically you can use Google Meet within the platform or Zoom or their, um, their own platform, which I think is called Blue Button. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, so would, the remote, would the fully remote students really just be part of whatever cohort was remote on that particular day? And, and how would we plan for non-duplication? I, I guess that the fully remote is just hard for me to grasp with the, the hybrid model and how those kids wouldn't necessarily be um, overlooked. Sure, they would be assigned to their own cohort. And um, in, again, it will depend upon staffing. And one of the, one of the issues that um, the Dennett faces is um, the beauty of the Dennett is their wonderful uh, size and their, their tight community. Um, it's in a situation like this where you need um, more, you know, uh, more flexibility, it becomes difficult because you don't have the same number of staffing um, or even full-time specialists, as Pete was referring to, that would make certain things easier to do in this, in this particular case. So um, one of the things that we are trying to do is dedicate staff solely to cohort, the, the remote learning cohort, so that they would have their own teacher as they would have. Um, in a bigger school, you might see multiple teachers assigned to a remote cohort based upon the numbers. Um, but here, uh, Pete's going to have to see who actually signs up for remote learning and then dedicate staff to that cohort so that they're able to get all of their learning needs met in an equitable way. So um, just like in-person learning, those students would receive all of the same opportunities 
with the exception of being in person, that in-person students would receive. But in theory, they would remain a separate cohort unless there becomes uh, a kind of a tug on resources and in which case uh, there might be opportunities for people in cohort C. Let's say we have, um, if art were to be taught solely remotely, then maybe um, multiple students have the same art teacher and might be um, working with that art teacher at a particular time. Can I also speak to a choice we made as a committee? Mr. Devonshire, we also made a commitment to have our students in Plimpton taught by Dennett teachers, regardless of how a family chooses to have their student educated. And we wanted to make sure that no matter what your comfort level and your family's comfort level, that you would all be receiving the same level of care and instruction from our dedicated staff. Um, that we love and know well. Um, some other districts are using a state program and we have opted not to send kids who go remote to that state program. Great, can thank I, you everyone. Can I just, uh, I, Mr. Wilhelmson, when you said to type in the chat, I thought you meant to type the comments in. Um, it's um, Dan Walker, um, fourth grade teacher at the Dennett. And I just wanted to say that you know, we, the teachers are, uh, you know, looking forward to finally, you know, when, once we have this decision, and I know you have all put such time and energy into trying to bring us back in the safest possible way, and we truly appreciate all the efforts. I've, uh, you know, heard a lot of the conversations that you've had and sat in a couple of meetings, and I truly appreciate it. And I think that the, our staff has proven to time and time again um, being very creative and resourceful and we are truly a team and we once we get going and as Mr. Venito said once we get going we will do what we can to make this unique situation the best situation for the students either in our classrooms or in a remote setting um, because we know and we truly um, appreciate and love our students and we know that um, this is going to be unusual for all of us. I saw a quote the other day saying we're all brand new teachers again. And I think that's truly how we all feel right now. But we are um, waiting and, and, and excited to be a strong word, but <laughs> um, anticipating, um, you know, working together and developing plans of action so uh, we can make this the best experience possible. So sorry, again, I thought when you said type in the chat, I was typing and I was slow, so. <laughs> but thank no you. We, we're making it work, right? We're adapting and making it work. Um, so we have a few questions that have been put in the chat. Um, one was about um, any issues with holidays and how that might impact or detrimentally impact one cohort or the other because of certain Monday holidays. Um, my guess is, is that when we'll take a look at the calendar and make sure that it's that it's equitable because we have to make sure that the students have um you know an equal amount of, of learning and certainly inside in class as well i don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on that but some a lot a lot of this is and a lot of these questions is part of the implementation that we still got to figure out there are a lot of details still to still to deal with um, there was a question about uh, whether we are going to be doing uh, COVID testing before we start school. I don't know if we have an answer on that yet or if that's also part of implementation. Jill? Um, we heard today from the commissioner that there will be more information forthcoming regarding the potential for testing, but as of today, nothing, nothing yet. But there may be something in the works. Um, Comment about the local board of health being the decision maker. Uh, we have, uh, I have a meeting with the emergency management um, folks on uh, early next week, and we're going to start those discussions to try and understand how the information is going to flow and, uh, and how we're going to deal with that. And the other point to the comment was, you know, we have schools across three towns in this district, and um, how is that all going to work together? Uh, it gives me an incredible headache trying to think about that. Uh, my answer is I don't know yet. Um, clearly, the, uh, to the best of our ability, we want to make sure that we have information as promptly as possible in order to be able to make the decisions that are right for the school. 
um, but we have a good working relationship with the folks in town and we will make sure that we have that sorted out before we open the doors of the school. Um, students had a phase and start date for returning to the building to students not starting on 916 start remote. Uh, again, we have not done the implementation plan, but that is my, that's probably where we would be. I think we need to think a little bit about, um, and we've had discussions here, uh, and also I've had discussions with Peter directly, that we need to think about how we get everyone off the ground to a successful start to the school year. Um, and I think by doing a phase and approach, it gives us some flexibility to make sure that everybody can be successful at remote. Uh, also to learn remote, because I think it is entirely unlikely that we will not be remote for some period of the school year. I, I just, you know, there's too much, too much going on, too much variability. But um, if school starts on the 16th, everyone's going to be back to school. And if they're not in the classroom, they will be remote. Yeah, again, from the daydreaming perspective, you know, we are going to leave this to Peter and his teachers, and they know our students the best, but coming in and meeting the teachers, maybe one-on-one -on -one small group in situations outside where potentially they could see their teacher's face would be a nice way to start the year instead of mask to mask. You know, bringing in our kindergartners and our high need students earlier um, so they can learn the routines of the school and the new normal that we're living under or other ideas. But again, I'm sure Peter and his team will be able to come up with some creative ways to use that time and to make it extremely valuable to all of our students. Uh, another question here was, uh, what is the plan if parents are working full time and unable to do remote synchronous learning with their child? I think that's part of implementation. I'm not sure we have an, have an answer for that at this point. Um, so, um, Comments have quieted down a little bit. We have a few things that we need to do here tonight. And in an effort to sort of be of service to some of the other elementary school committees, we had agreed to do a meeting with them at seven. Um, we need to, we, there's a couple of things and we, so we can continue to have some discussion, but we need to vote the plan uh, because it's due. <laughs> and so I, I think we need to do that. And then we have some other items on the agenda like the school calendar which I know we can't give folks much that's certain, but we can give you a start date. And by voting the calendar, at least we can, we can do that. So we want to get that done. And I think we want to also talk a little can bit I, about- Can I answer the question, John, that just showed up in the, in the chat? Yeah. Uh, so I can't answer if we'll be sending out information about Schoology early. That would be more Ryan and Peter to answer. But there have been rumors circulating around the state that any Schools that choose to start remote might not be eligible to participate in sports this year and might lose out on federal funding. Both of those rumors are rumors and are false. And I can tell you where they come from, um, but I don't want to spread rumors myself. What I can tell you is the MIAA is not governed by the Commissioner of Education. Um, so they're a separate entity and schools can have sports according to the MIAA, regardless of how they begin the school year. The rumor that there might be some funds withheld from schools if they go remote, again, comes from the US Capitol where the GOP has a bill um, for funding schools and all of the funding there is related to schools that open fully in person. Um, that bill is not gonna pass just in case anybody's wondering. So both of those things um, have been floating around the ether. They're not our concern. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, uh, so let's, let's, get, let's get this sorted. Um, now, just a point of clarification, Joe. The way I'm thinking about this, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page, is that the plan is the plan that has the three different models in it. And what we, are, what we have been discussing as preferences of the committee to do a phased-in hybrid is not in conflict with the plan, because the plan explains that. Well, or, or do we need to add something to the plan or, do, or make the motion to support the plan with a phased and hybrid approach to the start of school? Yes. Um, so the state needs to know 
how you intend to start, whether it be one day or 15 days. The state needs to know that. And if you're, you are starting, again, with a phased in hybrid approach, the state needs to know exactly what you mean by that. So if that means you are, would like to start remotely and eventually go hybrid, if that's not what you mean, but um, I, I think we need clarification so that we don't submit incorrectly what your intentions are. So Jill, I, I checked with MASC who checked with DESE and as long as our campus is open for some in-person instruction, mixed with students also receiving remote instruction, that is considered a hybrid opening. But, but, but perhaps we need to clarify what, as, a, as, an, as an addendum or mm -hmm. footnote, that this is how we will be doing it. And I guess if for the purposes of the plan, we need to pick a, like I just said, we're not gonna just pick a random date, but if we have to pick a random date for the plan, you know? I, I think I think what you're saying is is you're going to st your your hybrid would be to include uh, cohort D, your high need students, potentially um, some meetings with parents and students, but you would also offer remote learning on the same day in order for it to be counted towards an actual school day, because meetings alone do not count as actual school days, at least in the last meeting that we had with the commissioner. He wanted those, you know, he, he was pretty clear about that. So coupling it with remote learning that's also going to take place, I think would cover us in terms of it being an actual school day. That, that makes sense. Yes, Jason. Okay. So from us, if we So if, if we um, put a motion forward and it seems like you have a good understanding of what we are looking for, for, for what we're calling phased in hybrid, if we vote the plan, um, with that in the language, then that gives you what you need tonight. So saying that we, what we are approving the plan with an addendum to, to explain the phased in hybrid approach that we'll be using to start the school year, that should get you where you need to be for tonight. I believe so. Again, it's all new to us too. Yes, <laughs> so, I know. We're all. <laughs> yes, I, I think it at least clarifies because the, the, the model that we've been discussing is not as specific as the phased in hybrid approach that we just clarified. And I just wanna be clear in the plan because that is not the discussion that we're necessarily having in all of our communities. So I, I don't want to misrepresent or yep. not adequately serve uh, the, the Plimpton community in terms of what your intentions are. So this clarification has been very helpful and it will, should the committee vote this plan, that is we will uh, add a notation for Plimpton in particular and wherever else our other committees may go to note those potential differences so that we're not misrepresenting any yep. of our communities. We don't like misrepresentations. No. <laughs> okay, so um, any, other, any other discussion from the committee on that? So, Mr. Uh, yeah. I make a motion to accept hybrid as our entry with the phased in approach that we delineated here today with the understanding that Plinton will maintain six feet of distance, mass for all students K to six if medically able, and not to consider in-person full schooling until Massachusetts reaches phase four. With the two guiding principles at heart being getting our kids the best possible education possible and the health and safety of our teachers, our students, and our entire community. I'll second. I'll second that. 
All in favor, and we're going to do a roll call. Jason? Yes. Dan? Yes. Amy? No. Mike? You're on mute, Mike. I don't think he wants to answer. <laughs> <laughs> See if I can help him here. Mike, I didn't, we haven't heard what you, yes or no. Mike, I saw your lips move, but it didn't come through on audio. Yes. Can you yes. hear me now? Yep, that's good. Thank you. Uh, and I am a yes. Okay. So let me just look at the next thing here. Um, so, John, can we clarify for everybody that yep. is voting for remote and leaning into a hybrid model? Well, I would argue that we are voting for the hybrid model and we are, are that we and we are starting remote for some or most students in order to in order to have a successful start to the school year. For what period of time? Uh, as I said, um, we should we, we need to figure that out. Um, we're not talking about months, but if I give you a date right now, Peter hasn't done the work to figure out what he needs. Okay. I mean, it, you know, it's on the spectrum of Peter coming back to us and saying, hey, we don't really need to do this. I'd be happy to go in on the 16th. Or it could be on the other side of that saying, well, three weeks would be good. Understood. So we're looking at a possible hybrid model to start potentially mid-September after our teachers get back to the tenant and they figure out what is the best case scenario. Correct. We have to have right. time to plan this out. We also need the commitments from parents so that people can figure out who's where. Because okay. We've done a lot of work to kind of map it out potentially, but until you know, well, you map something out and five of those 10 students are remote, that changes everything. So. There's a lot of, a lot of pieces that need to come together here. And as soon as we have information for you, we are going to provide it to you in an effort to the folks can plan. And we understand that. I, I don't want to create, I don't want to create sort of false expectations because we haven't done that piece of the work yet or have the data to be able to validate the, all the work that's been done as a better way to put it. Understood. I think a lot of the parents just want to know, uh, are we looking at mid-September? That sort of thing, just it to be able to... Be a, it will be a start to, to, there will be a start of school mid-September. Uh, how exactly it looks like, we are going to be back to you as soon as possible. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Peter, did you have a comment? You looked like you... No, you did? I was just putting my pen down. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's jump around a little bit here. So we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about this stuff, but I want to get the school calendar discussion sorted. I want to make sure that we get, Jill, everything you need from us today, because we can always have another meeting and discuss other things. But I wanted to say the school calendar, I know you need. Um, <laughs> Thing, but everyone's trying to reach me. Um, so, Jill, did you want to did you want to speak to the calendar? Sure, I can. And um, forgive us, but we present you a calendar that will need further consideration even after tonight's vote. Um, and that's not how we would prefer to do business, uh, but it's how we recognize um, we may we may need to revisit this calendar. So I'll just start with the simple part, which is you have two copies of the calendar. One is the actual calendar that was voted, and the other is the calendar that reflects the incorporation of days starting on September 2nd 
because our teachers already have contractual days prior to September 2nd. So the first day of school, we are able to use the September 2nd up to September 16th for those training days that I described previously by the commissioner. So um, we would like to be able to use those to help prepare our teachers and students and families for um, our start to the school year, which would begin officially on September 16th. Now, one of the things um, that we may want to revisit, and again, I apologize to parents for this, um, but we would also need the principal's input, which we have not had a chance to meet with the principals to discuss the calendar. We've met with the principals to discuss enormous amount of, of information and to provide them with support during these, um, these days uh, in terms of preparing multiple um, samples for schedules, but we have not been able to get the time to discuss the school calendar. So you, we have a number of half days and one proposal on the table is to um, put those half days on the Wednesdays. Um, but we didn't want to make that proposal without talking to the school principals because we know some of these days line up with term dates, but I don't think that that would be something that would be impossible for us to pull together once we're able to speak with building principals and get their input. But in all fairness to uh, Pete and the other building principals, this is not something we have discussed, uh, but something that we want you to be aware of. It might be a way of kind of tightening up our calendar and making better use of time for, with students. And um, I, I would just note, you know, I know this was brought up last night at the Silver Lake meeting. Um, I'm, I'm glad we're looking at that because from my perspective, you know, there's a lot of, because of the scheduling that we're, we're doing here, you know, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of challenges for parents as it is. So, you know, if, if we're able to figure that out and put those half days on that Wednesday as a sort of something that we're gonna look into, I think that's just one more thing that at least helps because it's already a day that you're, you're, you're planning and it's not a day that you thought that your student would be in school. So um, I'm happy to do that. So uh, you're looking for us to vote the calendar with an understanding that we're gonna be relooking at it for those types of days? Yes, and also um, we're gonna be talking with the principals about how they wanna handle um, the, uh, the, the one Monday holiday at the, in the first semester and then the Thanksgiving. So we have one that occurs on a Monday and one that occurs on a Thursday in terms of cohorts. And we don't know to what extent um, that's a big deal to, to people, but we want to discuss that with our, our building principals as well to see if they have any recommendations as to how to handle uh, situations or circumstances like that. Because if, if this were to continue for a full year, there may be an imbalance. Um, but again, we're aware of it. We just haven't had the time to uh, finalize those important details. Um, so I, I, let's move it along. I'll make a motion that we uh, accept the calendar with the new start date with an understanding that we're going to relook at uh, some of the assignment of days in it. Second the motion. All in favor? Uh, roll call again. Jason? Aye. Amy? Aye. Dan? Aye. Mike? Aye. And on a yes on that as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay, right, thank you. Okay, um, there was a question here. Do we know how many have elected full remote to date? We have some information from that survey we showed, but we do not have a full commitment from everybody. So um, we're gonna, so that's great. We can segue into that. Um, we don't have a full commitment from everybody. We gotta get that and we gotta get that soon. Um, but folks have to be able to read the plan first. So I've got to make those amendments to it. And I assume it will be put up on the Silver Lake site, which we have a link to from the Dennett site to the pandemic information page. Um, when that goes up, I will post something to friends of the Dennett as well so that folks can have an added clue that it's there. Um, and then we have to get those, we have to get commitments from folks so that we can start that planning. Um, 
So the what is the plan was was is the proposal to reopen the existing survey, which might be kind of confusing because it's sort of it's looking for at other options that are even aren't even on the table, or are we thinking of doing a survey by school, or what? Why don't you tell us what you're thinking, Jeff? We're going to uh, send out a letter to parents with the uh, voted comprehensive plan attached. Okay. Once all of the comprehensive plans are voted, and there will be a form, and we will um, we will ask them to complete the form uh, based upon this new information. Again. We appreciate that they participated once, um, but the, I think the best way and the least confusing way would be to issue a uh, just commitments for bus and uh, remote because those are based upon um, the discussion tonight. Those are really the only two questions that we have to have numbers for in order to plan everything else. We need to know who intends to take the bus and we need to know who intends to stay remote, um, pure remote. Um, not hybrid, not phased in, but uh, their intention would be to stay remote for a full six months and they're able to make the commitment uh, at this time based upon the comprehensive plan. That's what we're looking for from people. I, I would just, so I think that's great. Um, two, two comments. One, um, one of the reasons this committee didn't ask for that, for the survey that was done was because we didn't feel like you could make a choice like that. We didn't even think to even ask to have a survey because we didn't have the comprehensive plan done yet. So now that we have that, we can do that. And that's great. I guess one other thing that I that might be helpful would be along with the question for the bus to say, no, I'm going to drive my student or yes, I need bus. Uh, a third option might be useful. Uh, that could be, you know, if there's availability, I would like bus from because I think that people are willing, to, a lot of people are willing to sort of step up if we need to do it to be able to do what's right for our community. But if we end up having four kids on a bus, you know, it might be really helpful for parents that could, could use that time to get to work. <laughs> so if that, if that makes sense, uh, I'll just offer that as a, as, a, as a thought so that I know it makes a little more work on our end, but I think it's a, it would be a good way to be able to know who really needs to be on the bus Really would, Go ahead, Joe. I would recommend making that question a survey question as opposed to a commitment statement. Ah. So like we did previously, I, would, I could include something like that, but then have something more formalized for people who are ready to commit to um, the other two, just so that we have uh, stronger numbers. Whereas that kind of question would be more represented in terms of percentages, that could also be helpful to us. That would be my recommendation. I, uh, otherwise, I, I don't know. Yep. Um, there was two other, two other points here. Um, uh, it's hard to commit uh, to a cohort without knowing, uh, or it's hard to make a commitment without knowing the cohort. Um, and I'm sure that that has to do with work schedules. Um, it's is a bit of a chicken and an egg thing. Uh, you know, we can't, do the cohorts until we have commitments, but some people can't do that without having. Uh, so, you know, I, I, Peter, I don't, I don't know how you want to answer that. I, I guess I would say we're certainly going to try and accommodate people as we can, but we kind of need an inf we need information to be able to do what we can there. Uh, another question was about uh, if you read a hybrid and parents' child does not like it, can we switch to full remote? Yes. Yes, um, we, as part of the plan, uh, students may not only want, but may need to switch to remote at some point based upon the circumstances. So yes, that is our, our intention. And uh, our intention is to staff that with um, staff from uh, our school. So um, Gordon, welcome to the meeting. Um, but he made a suggestion, maybe we can add as a preference, and that doesn't mean you can get it, but you have a preference to Monday, Tuesday versus Thursday, Friday. And then we have the data, and we're going to have to do what we can with it when we get it. So I'll note that out there. Um, 
we're gonna we're starting to run short on time. I wanted to make a quick comment regarding social media, both for like committee members as well as for everyone else on here. Um, for those who aren't familiar with it, we have open meeting law requirements in Massachusetts, and with that, um, the social the social media requirements under open meeting laws are even stricter than what they are in other forms of communication, which means if you have more, if there's more than one person from that committee speaking to committee business on social media, um, and another person chimes in, you have the potential for an open meeting law violation. Uh, as a result, this committee has always taken the, the tack that we try to be as quiet as possible in social media in order to avoid any issues with that. Some of you here will note that I have been a little more active and, uh, as of late, uh, but I think that's because of the times we're in and the need for people to get questions answered. Um, so what I would ask for my committee um, is, is please don't comment on things. If you see things, uh, feel free to throw it over the fence at me and I'll get to it. A um, Couple of other thoughts on that. Um, if I'm going to respond to stuff about Bennett and about what we're doing and, and things that I can respond to, I'm gonna do it on the Friends of the Bennett site and only there because I, I wanna make sure that we have it in one place. Um, and the other thing I'd like to just remind folks is that, um, is that um, uh, I have a full-time job too. So if you post a question and I don't respond to it right away, I'm not ignoring you. I just might actually have to do the stuff that the people that are paying me for want me to do. So uh, I, I take this real seriously that we get information out to everybody here and we answer questions, um, which is why I held that discussion on Monday. And I will do another one in the near future, um, probably when we have a little more information to share. Um, I want folks to feel connected and all of that. So just you know, bear with us as we get through this but um, certainly trying to make sure you guys have what you need out there. Any questions from my committee members? Okay. Um, Jason, we only have about six minutes left. Uh, do, we, do you wanna talk briefly about um, what we're starting to think about with respect to protocols from a sort of Dennett perspective above and beyond what Desi may have? Sure, so um, just in thinking about some of the questions that I know parents and teachers are having about feelings of safety and anxiety about re-entering buildings while COVID-19 is still a reality in our world. Um, I was trying to think of what do we use as metrics to slide between full in-person, hybrid, um, and remote. And DESE has supplied us with a comprehensive 19-page document that goes over protocols that are to be handled in-house um, by Peter and his nurse. And I believe, Ryan, are you our COVID-19 liaison for DESE? Right. I, re I read the documentation. Thank you, Ryan, for doing that. Um, but we, we have such a small town, and we've done such a good job managing COVID-19 in our town. Uh, again, I'd just like to reiterate, we have zero confirmed cases in the past 14 days. Uh, which is a wonderful thing. But according to the CDC, um, significant community spread is when you have more than 10 people per 100,000, and that would be one case in, in Plimpton, right? So this is where economy of scale doesn't really work for us. We have to be a little bit more realistic. So we wanted to look at how we would react to COVID-19 in the community and COVID-19 potentially uh, in the school. And now this is a draft. I've only shared it with John. We're bringing it to the emergency management team on Monday. Uh, but this, this is just a pathway we're thinking on um, so people can know September 1st or September 16th um, what it would take for us to slide between some of these different status of schooling methodologies. So right now we're, we're proposing a hybrid, which is um, Massachusetts is in phase three. We're admitting and acknowledging that there's still COVID-19 in Massachusetts. And we would be willing at this point to accept 
up to one case in Plimpton and still remain in a hybrid approach. Um, if we had two confirmed cases or more in Plimpton, um, we would then assess whether or not we wanted to move into what's called priority access. We could shut down the schools potentially for two to five days. That's per DESE's guidelines. Um, just to do some contact tracing, to clean the schools, to make sure it's not involved in the community within Dennett itself. Um, would also propose potentially moving to priority access if we have one single confirmed case within the Dennett family. So that would be a student or a staff member. We would shut down for two to five days. We would contact trace. We would make sure that our school was safe and um, it hadn't spread beyond that confines before we continued on in the hybrid approach. And, and remote is where it really gets a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more serious because that would be talking about a 14 plus day shutdown of the schools, which any shutdown of the schools, Ryan as our COVID-19 liaison has to contact DESE to let them know of the situation on the ground. We would have to liaise with the Board of Health and the emergency management team. Um, but we're looking for significant community spread in Plimpton to be uh, a case where we would go remote in Plimpton, regardless of what the state is doing or if we had two or more confirmed um, DENIC cases. Um, again, 14 days is the recognized period of time established by the CDC for symptoms to appear and for people to be considered um, safe out of quarantine. So this is again, just preliminary things that John and I have been talking about. Um, the committee has not voted on this. Um, this is not law and we're trying to garner feedback locally of what metrics we would use to shift between fully in-person, hybrid, priority access, and remote. So I, th I think it's safe to say we're gonna have a fair number more discussions about this uh, in the coming weeks. Um, we just wanted to make sure that folks are aware that we're starting, we're thinking about this as part of the implementation planning. And we'll have to, you know, we'll have to make sure that it all makes sense, not only for within our school, but for the district as well as for the town, because it's also, that's another piece of it. Um, before we, before we uh, jump off and, and for folks, if you're interested in what we're doing, we have a seven o'clock meeting with the uh, Kingston and Halifax elementary school committees that we are doing jointly. Um, we're not, I'm not anticipating that Plumpton is going to be conducting any more business there per se, but we're there to, I mean, to help the other school committees understand sort of what our thinking was and how what we voted here tonight. Um, uh, there is another posted meeting. If we were to have a breakout session, uh, I plan on canceling that tonight. I think we have completed what we need to do. Uh, that said, um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and I think we should need to get another meeting on the calendar uh, at the appropriate point when we have something to talk about. So, uh, Mr. Benito, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on that about what, what the timing is, if we map it out a little bit about when we should get together and have further discussions. Um, not at the present time, John. I think um, once we are able to gather some more data and, and, and have some more informed decisions, I think it would make sense at that point to, to establish another meeting. Okay. So maybe what I would suggest is, you know, uh, Joe, you and I can figure that out once we know when the plan's going out, when we know we're going to get the commitments back, and then liaise with you, Peter, to figure out what dates we need to get on the calendar so that we get those locked in for later in August. Okay. All right. I would like to thank everybody who joined us tonight. Um, I'm sure there's other things you could do on a nice summer evening. Um, I appreciate your, your, your understanding. I appreciate your input. Um, we'll, we'll keep communicating with you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so with that, I would look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? A second. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone.